Hi there and welcome again to the Explaining History podcast and today I'm going to continue with our exploration of the development of the SS and the camp system in Germany during the 1930s and today we're going to look at the Totenkopf SS, the the death's head, uh, perhaps the most notorious branch of the SS and one that most uh, listeners will be familiar with. Now, if you study um, Nazi Germany in school, the SS emerge as uh, significant characters in the kind of the narrative of, say, in the UK GCSE history study. When you look at the Night of the Long Knives, all of a sudden they're there. Um, prior to that, mainly the focus is on the SA and then the SS are a force and the, uh, the people that kill the leadership of the, uh, the SA. Uh, and that's kind of as much as they're mentioned before one goes on to, to study the Holocaust. But of course the, the development and the growth of the SS is um, a much more um, complicated story. So here we look at Nicholas Rashtman again, and he writes, The Death's Head SS expanded fast during the second half of the 1930s, growing from 1,987 men in January 1935 to 5,371 in January 1938. In each KL, each camp, these men were divided into two main groups. A select few, easily identified by the letter K on their uniforms, joined the so-called Commandant Staff and controlled most key aspects of the camps, including the prisoner compound itself. The rest belonged to the so-called Guard Troop sentries, with one Death Set Battalion, later regiment, stationed at every concentration camp for men. The guard troops were responsible for external security. They patrolled the camp perimeter and manned the watchtowers and shot prisoners who crossed the sentry line. They also guarded prisoners working outside, offering them the opportunity for hands-on violence. Although there were many points of contact between the guard troops and the commandant staff, the SS tried to maintain a division of duties, normally, Sentries were not even permitted inside the camp compound. This separation between running a camp and guarding it, a separation already in place at camps like Dachau, became the basic organisational feature of the KL. So that's uh, that's interesting that there is this subdivision between um, K staff and guard staff, um, and that there were strict rules uh, and boundaries as to where people could go. If you listen to the previous podcast on the camps and the SS, as I did, I think probably last week sometime, what uh, it w- what becomes clear is that uh, the the violence of the SS in, in the camps had to be strictly managed uh, and directed. It's not that the camp leadership were averse to violence; they were averse to disorder. So it, the um, most of the uh, camp SS men um, were sentries uh, in the guard troop, and these would outnumber uh, the commandant staff uh, by a ratio of about 12 to 1 uh, by 1937. So the, the K staff were really um, a minority, and so these were um, really treasured and um, sought after posts within the, the SS. Um, the sentries went through a selection process, and this meant that they, um, the image of the SS and the, the kind of the myth of the SS was that they were the elite. So even the, the rank and file, um, unlike the SA, had to be uh, carefully selected. Um, all recruits obviously had to be physically healthy, uh, were at least five foot six inches, 
um, and they had to uh, articulate physically the um, ideals of Aryan manhood, of uh, masculinity and manliness uh, and, and f- uh, physical, uh, uh, physical fitness. And um, they had to be able to trace back their Aryan heritage to the 18th century. Uh, there was a, a roaring trade in Germany of genealogists who were able to uh, investigate the family history and investigate racial purity going back many generations. Um, of course, these things were haphazard and um, these things could be gerrymandered and um, invented with the possibility of Jewish heritage sometimes being erased or the possibility of uh, some other kind of non-Aryan uh, aspect to family life uh, being kind of erased from, from the, the, the family tree. The head of the uh, camp system, Theodor Eich, who was um, Himmler's chief sadist um, in the, uh, the SS, um, was uh, involved in planning the recruitment strategy for the guard troop. And he was quite keen on recruiting them young. Um, there were 16-year-olds that he um, uh, recruited, and that age group between 16 and 20 was ideal for his purposes. After 20, he started to think that the um, the guard troop was getting uh, too old. Uh, obviously, this is uh, unlikely to be... They were too physically old. I mean, um, it was probably that... They were uh, slightly more becoming in their twenties, slightly more difficult to mould, to indoctrinate, to to shape. And Nicholas Vashman writes, the boys, as him and called them, were thought to be easily malleable into political soldiers. A more pragmatic motive, given the tight purse strings of the SS, was that single young men came cheap. Ike's obsession with youth changed the camp SS with the average age dropping to around 20 by 1938. Many new recruits had enrolled straight out of the Hitler Youth, but Eich did not welcome all applicants. They were supposed to show passion for their chosen path and be eager to devote their lives to the SS. Here Eich was drawing on the ideal of the volunteer soldier, a figure long associated in national circles with with dedication and self-sacrifice. So, ironically, the SS, which later becomes um, the the bastion of careerism uh, and a place that many careers in the Third Reich um, grew from, um, Eich himself didn't really want careerists. He wanted fanatics. He wanted those who were passionate simply about the cause of Nazism in itself, the cause of racial purity. Um, how many of these he found was actually questionable, as he uh, found that the demand for new recruits was far outpaced um, the number of suitable recruits based on those criteria who were actually um, available. Somehow, however, I managed to achieve his goal, perhaps by dropping standards or his own particularly perverse racial standards. And by the late 30s, um, most of the Camp SS were made up of teenagers and most of the Camp SS um, were volunteers. The Death's Head had attracted lots of teenage boys and and young men um, with the idea that it was an elite military unit. Now, the the fighting wing of the the SS, the the Waffen-SS, um, during the Second World War, uh, that becomes one of the uh, the elite uh, arms of the German military. That might be true of them, but the um, the mythology of the the Death's Head uh, SS actually far outweighed any kind of military prowess that they might have had. Um, recruitment material um, painted um, or created a kind of a, a false parallel between the Death's Head, uh, and uh, the army. And um, it, it, it implied that the uh, recruits would be carrying out special secret uh, missions for the Fuhrer, um, which kind of allows, in the minds of uh, young German boys, 
the kind of fantasy of of playing at soldiers. Um, the reality was that um, these op- these things didn't really happen in the life of uh, SS men. They were they were uh, if they were in the, their death head, they were camp guards uh, and later. Um, participants in war crimes and uh, in the Holocaust, um, which perhaps was, when we talk about secret missions for the Fuhrer, that might have been actually what really was being implied. The campsite of the um, of this advertising was never mentioned, uh, perhaps because the idea of, of being a camp guard is less attractive um, because, perhaps because there were, even for recruits into the SS, um, moral questions that would have to be raised about camp guard duties, and moral questions which fly out of the window once one's actually doing the job and being indoctrinated by people like Theodor Eich, but moral questions nonetheless. So these things are, uh, are brushed into the carpet. Um, most applicants would probably have had an idea where they were going to be stationed, um, but the camp duty isn't really seen as a particular selling point. Um, so I imagine that in the minds of, there's a kind of a, a cognitive dissonance in the minds of people joining uh, the death's head, knowing that really they probably were going to be camp guards, but allowing themselves to indulge in the fantasy of um, being secret agents or uh, commandos for the Fuhrer. The the training of recruits, uh, which involved parades and marches, obstacle courses and weapons exercises, was, was hard. It was difficult. Um, newcomers were beasted by the uh, older SS men. Um, they, they had the uh, process that most armies go through of breaking civilians down for, and, and then rebuilding them in the model of, of uh, what the organisation requires. And the organisation here requires not so much military discipline, but the ability to uh, be sadistic and violent. Um, many of the uh, SS men, the older officers, were veterans of the First World War, um, and they unleashed their frustrations and their resentments and their bitterness and their anger and their sadism on new recruits. Um, they drilled us, uh, one SS man, a man later recalled, uh, till we howled with rage. Um, the uh, deliberate kind of brutalization of the um, SS recruits was uh, a way of storing up in them um, a, a violence that which could then be uh, unleashed upon the people that they um, uh, that, that, that they controlled. Um, it was a way of weeding out the weak men, those who would be unwilling or unable to um, carry out uh, acts of sadism, and there were those who would break down, who would uh, have, have physical or emotional collapses, um, and they had... Um, were kind of got rid of after three months of, of probationary service. There were those who um, actually took to um, the uh, military um, brutality um, and saw it as an opportunity to demonstrate their toughness. Those were the ones who were favoured and, and seen as being ideal for the future. Recruits taken into the guard troop would have a, a, a rotation of uh, military drill and uh, a week of sentry duty each month, um, which was obviously far more tedious and time-consuming and boring than anything that they felt they'd sign up for. Um, the men lived in uh, communal barracks, which were highly regimented, um, and some felt themselves to be um, rather like uh, prisoners themselves, but uh, with rifles and uniforms. There was a great envy of uh, other units, such as the Waffen-SS formations, like the Liebstandard Adolf Hitler, who were better equipped and better paid, who were, uh, had higher, lo- higher prestige, and who generally were everything that they, uh, they, the death's head recruits 
thought they'd signed up uh, to to be. Um, the, uh, the deaths head uh, men were often uh, the, in the guard troop were often uh, mocked as being the kind of the sentries and the, the watchmen. Well, um, the uh, Liebstandart and uh, Das Reich and other Waffen SS divisions got to do the, the exciting stuff. Morale was uh, not uh, particularly high uh, amongst the Death's Head, and um, the difference between the heroic self image uh, and the mundanity of camp life um, was difficult to, to bridge. Uh, I said, I'm aware of your hardships and I'm striving every day to remove them, but this can only be done one step at a time. It's possible that a perceived lack of prestige had a part to play in sadism uh, and violence. Obviously, this is caused by innumerable things and by the entire nature of the camp and the training and, and all, all the rest. But um, the desire to demonstrate... Um, to overcompensate and to show um, adherence to the uh, will of the Führer and to be shown to be of equal standing with the uh, Waffen-SS um, encouraged ever greater um, displays of, of violence towards uh, prisoners. Um, there were many of the men from the guard troop who trusted Eich and believed him. He was, to them, quite a charismatic figure, uh, quite a, a leader, uh, almost a kind of a paternal figure. Um, and they believed that one day that there would be, in career terms, and here it's interesting, we sort of start to shift back towards kind of careerist thinking, because there wasn't enough within the role to sustain a, a kind of voluntarism, um, that there would be um, rich rewards uh, as a result. The Camp SS did offer advancement towards um, a better work and more um, prestigious work. Um, and there were few other places in the SS um, that um, careers could develop um, quite as quickly, especially if, the, if, if one's education was, was fairly minor. Um, there were uh, numerable figures rising through the camp SS who were not particularly bright in it, in it by any stretch of the imagination. Um, there were those interviewed after the war. People like, for example, Franz Stangl, uh, who was interviewed by Gita Sereni. And uh, Gita Sereni found him, he was the commandant of Treblinka, and Gita Sereni eventually found him not to be a particularly uh, the, the sort of kind of a demonic sort of figure, but a, a rather dull and banal and you know, trivial little man, I think she referred to him as, um, and no doubt that there were um, a number of, of figures like that. So uh, it could it was possible to become an officer in just a couple of years, um, and the uh, commandant staff um, were full of men who had uh, started off in the guard staff and, and begun to move over. Um, and the superiors, uh, in the eyes of their superiors, these were people who had proven themselves, uh, firstly as political idealists or politically loyal, um, and now those who were able to be kind of more, more managerial. And of course, one of the most um, significant of, of these figures would later be the person who would later become the commandant of Auschwitz, Rudolf Hurst. Now, if you go way back to the archives, it must have been two years ago now at least, uh, I talked about the memoirs of Rudolf Hurst uh, and his um, kind of last testimony before he was executed. Um, uh, he was, his story tells us quite a lot about Nazism. He was uh, born in uh, 1900 and um, he uh, served in the First World War as a teenager and uh, served in the Freikorps immediately afterwards. It was men like Rudolf Hurst who had engaged in some of the Freikorps bloody battles, not just in Germany but in the Baltic states uh, against the, the new uh, Bolshevik regime. Um, he uh, was obsessed with violence 
uh, and yet was um, a very kind of emotionally brittle individual um, and was uh, convicted for murder um, in 1924, killing after having killed a communist. Um, and that throughout his, uh, his story, his, his, his biography is documented very well by Richard J. Evans in um, the, the Coming of the Third Reich. Um, and it, it's uh, dotted with kind of periods of, of dark depression and emotional instability. And there seems to be some kind of journey uh, for kind of completion and identity and belonging. And not that I'm being sympathetic and trying to psychoanalyze mass murderers here, but those motivations do tell a story. Um, during the 1920s, Hearst had forged all these connections with extreme right-wing groups in the Freikorps uh, and all that. And it was these that eventually brought him to the, the, the SS um, camp system. Um, he joined the Nazis in the early 20s, and that's when he'd met Himmler. And in 1934, um, when uh, Himmler was inspecting the SS, Hearst had joined in 1933, um, Himmler suggested to him that he advise, he join uh, the the Death's Head uh, in the the SS camp system. Hearst accepted, um, and he was um, tempted really by the careerist opportunities that were there. And when he joined Dachau as a sentry, four months later, I chose him. From the guard troop to the com- uh, to move from the guard troop to the commandant staff in this manner that we've been talking about in, in in the podcast, and that really was his journey, not just from Dachau but eventually uh, to Poland once uh, in 1939, and to running the new institution of uh, Auschwitz. Um, Hearst's um, career would probably be more meteoric than anybody else's. Uh, in any other recruit level person in the SS um, but his story, his background was quite similar um, to many other on the commandant staff they were largely in their 20s and 30s they were older than the young boys in the guard troop and most of them had previously had some kind of military uh, background either in the First World War or in the uh, fighting for the party in the 1920s, or in the Freikorps, some kind of military or paramilitary role. And they had been early adopters of Nazism. And in spring, the spring of 1934, eight of the 11 officers in the Dachau Commandant Staff had very low SS membership numbers, under 10,000. So that showed that they were in the first generation of men to have joined the SS. They weren't these kind of uh, late adopters. OK, so we're going to carry on more with that uh, probably next week sometime now. But uh, I hope you found that useful and interesting. If you can support us via Patreon, that's very, very helpful, gratefully received. And I'll catch you on the next Explaining History podcast. All the best. Thanks. Bye-bye.